Welcome, everyone. It's time to surveil some meat space. All right. We are still seeking volunteers. Last I heard, the volunteer tent is just yonder. So uh, if you've had a great time at EMF camp and you want to give back, this is a great way you can do that. Please welcome, with Meat Space Surveillance, Alexander Martin. Thank you all very much. Uh, I should apologize first off. My laptop, the, the file system got corrupted. So no slides. Um, I will be talking, which is uh, something people do, I guess. Uh, I've got a video as well, which might be interesting. Um, I'd like to thank Mustafa, Fran, Charlie, and Toxgoda for trying to save it and making it worse. Uh, also like to, particularly Toxcode, I'm sure it's the first time anyone has asked to borrow a hacker's laptop to turn off two-factor authentication for their work emails. Thank you, much appreciated. So basically, first slide um, would have been a Galileo quote, measure what is measurable, make measurable what is not so. So I didn't say that, that's just something in your head from seeing the slide, and now we seamlessly enter into the, the talk. Um, essentially, this is a, a talk about biometrics. The etymology of the, the word biometrics is obvious enough. Bio, meaning organic life, metric, being to measure. Um, and we understand what biometrics are pretty simply enough, right? Fingerprints, they are patterns. It's uh, a fairly established maths in, in terms of how you differentiate patterns. And in, with DNA, nucleus high sequences, there are more potential sequences than there are humans in existence by magnitudes upon magnitudes. So these can be used to identify people pretty easily. Faces, I mean, how faces are more difficult because it's not necessarily completely obvious how you go about measuring a face. Um, essentially, there are, there, are, there are two ways you can approach this. Um, they really get their, their best comparison in a, a 1993 write-up by Brunelli and Poggio, uh, which is called Facial Recognition, Features versus Templates. So I'm gonna, this is really where slides would have been helpful because I'm not a scientist, I'm a journalist. When we get to the government stuff, I'm great, but the science side, I'm, I'm not a scientist again. I will try my best. So Brunelli and Poggio ran, ran tests in 1993. These, these were really set up to work, to be successful. And they found that um, they got 90% they got accuracy when they used the feature method of matching faces and perfect accuracy with the template matching. And these are still the dominant ways in which facial recognition works today, so it might be going, worth going into them a little bit briefly again, lack of slides. So uh, what is feature-based matching? Uh, it's uh, geometric relative positions of, of your eyes, your, your nose, your mouth, um, basically anything from the eyebrows down counts as the face. The face is... Uh, on the contrary, in terms of template matching, uh, holistically represented. Um, Feature-based is earlier. It's, it's really one of the first. It's in the 50s as a scientist called Woodrow Wilson Bledsoe, uh, named after the, the former president who brought the US into the First World War. And it was um, input on a, on a graphics tablet, which was developed by ARPA, who also, or funded by ARPA, not developed by ARPA, potentially the RAND tablet, um, who also potentially funded the initial facial recognition research. That's not public. I mean, I don't know. That's a guess. Um, they probably did. Uh, template matching is, um, well, it's a, it's a fairly mo bit more typical um, digital image processing activity. And again, where the slides would have been perfect in terms of presenting how it looks visually, basically the face, it, the face is... Um, represented in a bi-dimensional array of intensity values. So you've got your x-axis, you've got your y-axis, and again, fortunately, most faces are quite symmetrical. So you can have a look at how the, how the you can see visually how the face is um, kind of presented. The images are compared then, you have obviously, in any facial recognition system, you have an input sample image captured through CCTV or body one video, and you have a database of images. Uh, in the UK, these are largely custody photo images. Um, many of which it seems are being held illegally. We'll get onto that. And the sample image and the database image are compared with sort of typical Euclidean distances or more commonly um, using uh, convolution masks. A um, bit more into the science side, uh, feature-based matching depends on 
using a, a vector of uh, geometric features, which in itself requires the images to go through a normalization process so that the uh, features, again, nose, eyes, etc., uh, are represented, can be represented independently of the position scale and rotation of the face in the, in the sample image plane. This is uh, achieved by Brunelli and Poggio by, by setting the intraocular distance and the direction of the eye-to-eye -eye axis. Um, that is still, for those who are worried and want to maintain your privacy, the key element in any facial recognition technology, as far as I'm aware. If you have, with the triangles of your eyes and nose, if that's obscured enough, you're, you're not going to be recognized by uh, at least an automated facial recognition system, potentially. Uh, other than that, yeah, good luck. Um, I will uh, leave aside the, the process of extracting features from that plane because it is, is pretty complicated, but I, I, I guess most, most of you would be able to guess how you may do it when you're, when you're dealing with um, gradient directions in a, in a face. Um, and, and that's really what, uh, well, I guess on the template matching as well, um, yeah, we've gone through that. Uh, and that is the, the, the idea, at least behind the technology, that underpins most of the technology. Well, that's what underpins most of the tech, blah, blah, blah. Uh, questions persist, though, inevitably, about how well it works. And I'm going to quote at a bit of length uh, here from an introduction to a paper by John Daugman, uh, the University of Cambridge, the guy who in invented iris recognition, uh, because he, he brings up a, an excellent point when it comes to the scalability of such systems. Dagman, in his introduction to the paper, which is titled Searching for Doppelgangers, Assessing the Universality of the Iris Code Imposters Distribution, start, starts off with the, the well-known birthday problem. Um, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with it for the sake of those who aren't. It's a, a problem which asks, how large does a group of people need to be before it is probable that two of them share the same birthday? So you think 365, maybe it's half of that. It's not, it's 23. It is probable, if there are 23 people in a room, that two of them will share the same birthday. Uh, and this is a, 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 there is, uh, according to Dagman, an analogous biometric birthday problem. I quote again, for a given similarity threshold yielding some specified false match rates for single comparisons, he asks, how many different persons must the database contain before it becomes likelier than not that there is at least one biometric collision? Weak biometric technologies, such as face recognition, are usually tested and operated at the very undemanding criterion of false match rates equaling 0.001, which means that any given pair of random persons have probability of 0.999 of not being matched to each other. Since n persons, I'm going to skip the science too much, or the maths too much here, basically, Dagman says, this occurs when there are just 38 or more persons. That is the point at which uh, a false match rate of 0, 0 0 0.001 um, will bring up a, f a false match. Um, this uh, Dagman is is looking at this in a, in a at a great degree of scale, and uh, as a, as a, in terms also of complete automation, facial recognition systems in practice don't just say match or no match. They will bring up a list of likely candidates of match who've been input to, input to that system. Um, as far as I'm aware, that uh, is. Mostly all of them, but I'm not sure. I have to admit, and especially when we got onto the government side of things, government isn't tr tremendously transparent about this stuff. Uh, there is a limit to my knowledge, but I will present what I know. Uh, on the other hand, you have um, a man called Alessandro Acquisti, who did, I apologize to him if he ever sees this and sees me murdering his surname, uh, who did a study for Carnegie Mellon, which I will again quickly quote the summary from because it is a, a very interesting um, study uh, and particularly relevant. Uh, he says, we investigated the feasibility of combining publicly available web 2.0 data with off-the-shelf face recognition software for the purpose of large-scale automated individual re-identification. Two experiments demonstrated the ability of identifying strangers online on a dating site where individuals protect their identities by using pseudonyms and offline in a public space uh, based on photos made publicly available on, social, on a social network site. A uh, third proof of concept experiment illustrated the ability of inferring strangers' personal or sensitive information, their interests and social security numbers from their faces by combining face recognition, data mining algorithms and statistical re-identification techniques. The results highlight 
the implications of the inevitable convergence of face recognition technology and increasing online self-disclosures and the emergence of personally predictable information, um, Acquiesce absolutely thinks and expects that we will have, and it is feasible to implement enormous uh, facial recognition systems. Um, interestingly, he looked a lot at, at Facebook, and Facebook uh, was um, sort of called up on this uh, a few years ago uh, in the States, with particularly a senator, Al Franken, bringing a Democratic senator, bringing forward the sort of concern that uh, Facebook now has the, the largest database of face prints on people anywhere in the world. Um, Interestingly, uh, Facebook was audited uh, by the Irish Data Protection Commission uh, in 2011 and 2012, and it was told then it, was, it had to delete all EU face prints um, for tag suggestions, which is, you know, I don't use Facebook, I assume you guys might, uh, where, you know, you upload a picture and it suggests who your friends are, and it does that through using a, a tag suggestion uh, feature, uh, this was determined by the Irish Data Protection Commission to be uh, unlawful. Um, whether Facebook has actually started deleting stuff or not, we don't know. Um, I've asked, tried to get in touch with Facebook. They haven't returned my calls. Guys, please, please do, you know. I'll be friendly. Um, I spoke also to, uh, to Ross Anderson at the University of Cambridge about this, and I, I want to quote his points as well because they're, they're pretty uh, sterling, as, as you can imagine Ross's points are. Um, so he says the practical question is whether in a given application you can limit the number of suspects against whom you're matching and whether you have photos of them. The several million people whose mugshots are on the police national database in the UK may be rather many and may give rather high false positive rates, false negative rates or both depending on how you set your recognizer. But there are 3,500 terrorist suspects in the UK, as the NCA says, then that's doable. Um, just targeting them, potentially. The 35,000 people involved in serious organized crime should also be doable. That doesn't mean that you will recognize any of them will, with any certainty when they walk through Waterloo Station, but you may recognize them often enough for it to be useful. Um, Anderson's points are sharp uh, and uh, bring us really onto the, the state use of uh, facial recognition in the UK. Um, so you mentioned the police national database. This is really, really old at this point. It's based on a 1970s Fujitsu mainframe. Um, Basically, when you see companies put tenders out for uh, people who know how to work with that really old tech, um, it is to support government contracts almost always. Um, the PND holds, uh, well, in 2014, we knew it held 13 million images. That is roughly 20% of the UK's population has its face captured there. Some of these may be uh, duplicates. So maybe not all of you has your, have your faces there, but it is statistically likely that somewhere between 15 and 20% have their faces held by police. Um, we know this particularly because of a Biometrics Commissioner report in 2014. The Biometrics Commissioner at the time is a QC called Alistair McGregor, and he brings up the fact that uh, his role as under the Protection of Freedoms Act covers DNA and covers uh, fingerprints, but does not cover facial images. And in fact, facial images do not occur anywhere in British law. This is a completely unregulated area, which is why the police have so quickly been able to go towards it. Although they're still acting unlawfully, and I cite the commissioner's report, in areas of fingerprints and um, DNA profiles. Uh, so in, in 2012, if we, we jump back a bit, there was a, a high court ruling um, and the High Court ruling was, uh, was brought on behalf of individuals who weren't uh, named, with good reason, I imagine, uh, because their facial images were being kept uh, on the police on the, by the Metropolitan Police on the PND. Um, the High Court ruled that this was really not acceptable. Um, I can't quote again, I, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, but determined that the Met Police needed to delete these pictures and should do so, and I, this is a, a very cl close uh, paraphrase, in a matter of months, not years. And they said that the policy needed to be revised. Government said it would revise the policy. Met Police said it would, would pay attention to that. So that was in 2012. In 2013, the, the government hadn't yet uh, produced a biometric strategy. In 2014, it didn't again. Last year, it didn't again. It hasn't done so this year yet. Uh, maybe it's coming. The Metropolitan Police, I do want to find this quote. Uh, I won't, though. 
The Metropolitan Police, on the other hand, when asked, they, a Freedom of Information uh, request to them under the Freedom of Information Act was sent in uh, December of last year to the Metropolitan Police. Liberty were um, part of the uh, supporting the claim against the MPS in the 2012 High Court uh, case. And they said in that they so they asked, how's this progressing? You know, it's been three years. And the Met Police said, progressing brilliantly. We've deleted 560 photographs. And then they said, the issue is our IT systems aren't set up to handle a complex retention policy. So, we, so and that presumably is a policy which allows you to delete photographs as well, as, as store them. So, yeah, great, great forward movement there. Um, I'm at the Met Police said, and this is late 2015, they said they're implementing a new system this year. Uh, I'm unaware that that's been done yet. I'm fairly ignorant, though. The Met don't come and tell me everything they do. The Biometrics Commissioner also unaware that they've done anything yet. Um, and that was in his uh, 2015 report, which is interesting again. I mean, he submitted his report in December uh, for 2015. They didn't publish it until March, maybe even later. The, the movement from government on this, on this uh, whole area forward has been pretty, pretty um, slow. I will say from a completely objective perspective. Um, government has also, uh, the Science and Technology Committee of Parliament also brought up some criticisms of the massive amount of uh, facial images which was being retained by the state. Um, and the government said, yeah, we're, gonna, we're doing a review into this, a review of custody images. Um, that hasn't been published yet either. From what I understand, uh, it was really, really, really bad and they just pushed it away. And it's going to be rolled in some way into the biometrics review, which, again, has not yet been published. Uh, so that's, that's at least where, where we're at with the PND. There are other uses, of course. Um, I don't know how many people here went to Download Festival uh, last year. Show of hands. Yeah. You're, you're, too, you're too cool for that. You're too techno. That's cool. Um, not, uh, Leicestershire Police is in charge of download, uh, policing for downloads, and they use some facial recognition technology there. You may have read that. You may have read it on the register. So good for you. Um, we were the first to publish it. Uh, this was not mugshot matching. This was real time. This was live. This was everyone going to download, having their face compared to a, a bespoke database that Leicester Police said it had uh, constructed itself. Um, so they created the database, they basically collected, that database was collected uh, by um, sort of bringing together the mugshots of between 1,200 and 1,600 offenders from across Europe who were known to target large music festivals to commit crime. Uh, none of them turned up at download. None of them at all. Not only that, but uh, in terms of how well it actually worked, uh, the force said that uh, the... the Trial was control trial. A number of officers and staff who had volunteered to have their photographs entered into the database were successfully picked out by it 77 times during the course of their duties in, in Donington Park, where it was held. Uh, no information is provided to tell you how valuable this was or, or contextualize this figure, such as the total number of times they should have been picked out or how strenuously they attempted the test, the proof of concept system. Furthermore, uh, Leicester Police run a mugshot matching uh, facial recognition suite um, at their, their uh, offices in, in Leicester. Uh, this is provided by a corporation, NEC Corporation, and the suite is called Neoface. Um, NEC Corporation uh, get paid for Neoface now. Uh, they weren't paid, however, for download when they did it off their own cuff. Uh, well, they were asked to do it. It's not quite clear why they were asked to do it or how they were asked to do it. But they went and they, they attended, uh, they, they sort of gave this stuff out for free. There was no cost to it. And subsequently, the police announced there was no policing purpose, policing utility for it. Um, again, they also said the trial was not even being evaluated by Leicestershire Police. It was all held, all evaluations were held by the vendor. Um, so yeah, out of 90,000 attendees, no one was picked up. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so this is CCTV IPTV footage, and uh, we reported on it shortly beforehand, to, uh, this is a moment in which you get some uh, relief from looking at my mug. Uh, it's provided beforehand, and uh, we tried to get in contact with Muse, actually. They didn't respond to us. They did respond to uh, 
attendees. And this is a bit of them singing as soon as I work this mouse. You get sound? Sound? So that's the, the second bit of that is just as illegible to, uh, to me as uh, I'm sure it was to you. But fuck Leicestershire Police is, is fairly audible. Um, I was at, uh, I then went to uh, a bit later, I managed to speak to Simon Cole, who's the Chief Constable of Leicestershire Police. And uh, he said he felt very alone, very targeted when fuck Leicestershire Police was, was said, which I'm sympathetic for. Um, I am, no one wants to hear uh, sort of 90,000 people cheering the idea of, of you as a, a bad person, especially if you are there to prevent crime. Um, and it, that is his purpose, and that is how Leicester Police look at the matter. Uh, I, so, when we talk about uh, the, all the faces that are held on the, on the PND, a lot of these are people who haven't been convicted, and therefore their photos should be released, unless they've been arrested and they've accepted a caution. Because if you accept a caution, you are accepting your guilt, even though you've never been to court and you may not have had any legal advice. And if you do accept a caution under the Protection, uh, under the protection of Freedoms Act 2012, uh, your biometrics, your facial image, your fingerprints, your DNA may be stored indefinitely. Um, that doesn't expire. So don't accept cautions if you're innocent. What else uh, he said, though, was an interesting anecdote. Um, and they, 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 they love it. They absolutely love the, the use of the technology, and they, they trialed Neoface for me. And it, it is impressive. A lot of it I, I did find, at least, and the samples I, I was shown may well have been particularly uh, presented to me in a way that was going to make light of the uh, criticisms that could be placed against it and show the, the exceedingly good policing purpose. But he pointed out a case to me and an argument to me which is hard from a, a civil libertarian perspective to question. He said, he talked, told me of a time in which a man who'd been to have his passport photo taken uh, had subsequently, uh, a woman had alleged he'd sexually attacked her. And they arrested this man, they managed to find him because of this passport photo and, and using Neoface, and then arrested him. The woman, however, the victim, did not want to press charges. She did not want to go through that. So at that point, this man is unconvicted. He is innocent, and the police have a lot of evidence. They could go prosecute. They could go with the CPS to prosecute. But the lady, the victim, whom should be prioritized, does not want to go through with it. At that point, what should they do with his image? Simon Cole's position is that they should offend or manage, that his, there should be some facility to keep hold of this image. And I'm not sure that there shouldn't be. But then, following on from that, I asked him, why not keep everyone's image then? Why not, if, we're, if, we're, if it's no harm to innocent people, why not have every innocent person's image on there? At which point, he was quite happy to say, well, we're in the land of Orwell then. So, a, a cop saying that, which is brilliant. Um, and he's right. I mean, I, I'm not sure how, how we go about um, finding the balance between measuring who, who should be exposed to potential state uh, surveillance through uh, facial recognition and who should not be. Um, this is also happening in Ireland, I should say, that the Irish guards, the Garda Shear Corner, um, recently proposed uh, in their new five-year program to professionalise and modernise their systems, uh, which are mostly still paper-based, uh, by adding some facial recognition technology. Wish them the best of luck of that. It won't be easy. Um, you're also seeing it in Manchester, where uh, the police have strapped on about 3,000 body cameras, body-worn video, it's called officially, uh, which is being stored in the clouds. Um, you're seeing that in London, where the Metropolitan Police are doing it. So there are a lot of questions here, but um, there, are, there are very little 
uh, bits of, of legislation and, and uh, regulation of the area. Um, one particularly interesting bit is uh, another commissioner who's um, found uh, his position again comes from the Protection of Freedoms Act 2013. He's a surveillance camera commissioner, and basically what he does is he upholds and, and tries to uh, encourage the adoption of something called the Surveillance Camera Code of Practice. Um, and I've got a lovely statement from his office that I do want to read out. Uh, his position, however, is that, um, I can't read it out, the surveillance camera code of practice uh, requests that if you are using a camera, surveillance camera, you tell the public that you're doing it. That we have policing in this country, but it is by consent. And if what you are, do and what you are doing to the footage as well, if you're applying facial recognition, facial recognition technology to the footage, the public should also be aware of that. Um, that is, in his terms, part of what, manda what is included in the Surveillance Camera Code of Practice. And the Code of Practice, it is mandatory for police and uh, state organisations to follow that. Anyone who controls a CCTV camera, uh, or surveillance camera in general, it could be IPTV, it could be anything. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm signing out on this because of the, the issue with my laptop. Um, but in short, we don't have regulation on this matter at the moment. From what I understand, the new biometric... Uh, so, Alison McGregor QC uh, finished his two years in the role uh, a few months ago. From what I understand, the new biometrics commissioner doesn't want to do what he did because it isn't part of his statutory obligations. Um, he's, uh, the new commissioner comes from science, not a legal background. Um, oh, there is another thing I meant to mention as well. And there isn't much claim or cause at the moment to chase up facial recognition. A big part of this is that um, the Home Office is, is settling complaints to it on biometrics out of court. So there was a, and this is only from a small Home Office uh, minutes document, a biometrics group meeting, where they say they have six complaints against them at the moment, uh, three of which from unconvicted people, three from convicted. Putting the convicted to the side, you've got three unconvicted people who are taking the Home Office to the European Court of Human Rights to say that uh, their biometrics are being unlawfully held. And the Home Office in that situation, because the European Court of Human Rights will allow this, are uh, amicably arbitrating, they're settling this case uh, out of the court. And this does two things. Potentially, it saves the taxpayer money if, if those people were going to claim millions, which I think is unlikely. What it also does, it avoids setting a legal precedent for any, any, um, any embarrassing opportunity, any opportunity to embarrass the government and its very delayed uh, biometrics review. Uh, so if any of you guys have had your biometrics uh, slurped up, you, by all means, uh, you need to, to protect, your, protect your rights. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to, uh, to answer your questions, but if you do want to shoot questions at me, I'll give it a go. Yeah? Shout it. Or if you guys need the stage back, we can do it outside. Yeah, I mean, it, we, were, we were a bit... Uh... Actually, no. All right, close to 30 minutes. Yeah, so you said that um, it's 20 to 15% of the public... Does that mean that they've got images of people who aren't criminals and haven't been arrested? Or is this when they're booking people before arrest and then they're releasing them? How are they getting the images from people that haven't been convicted? So that's an excellent point. So just on the Police National Database, which I should say is a single database of comparison, it is absolutely possible that they are using um, bulk, data, bulk personal data sets, as uh, have recently been disclosed to be a thing, to especially, it wouldn't come under, police wouldn't be able to do it, but it could come under the directed surveillance powers under Ripper to get enormous data sets, say the passports database, um, for, for um, also facial recognition. Again, though, that is at such a level of security that it isn't possible for us to know. Um, of course, I also forgot to mention um, social media images are being used. I mean, if you, but they're being used as sample images rather than the, the custody images. So, um, and this is done lawfully. I mean, these would be open source images from the police's perspective. But it is concerning. I mean, when we talk about putting stuff in public, it is very public. And any, any, anyone will look at that and will potentially use it for any purpose, as I'm sure this audience uh, will, will know from its own experience of dealing with black hats. 
uh, or, or blue hats as that sort of uh, odd model seems to, to threat model seems to be developing. Um, yeah, how does you talked about the fact that facial images are not uh, mentioned in law at the moment from this perspective? How does that interact with data protection? So the, the Data Protection Act does cover personally identifying information, which uh, facial, facial images are considered part of. So they wouldn't be able to um, simply just push that out everywhere. And, and it's still, I mean, it's been the case for a long time in libel law, for instance, that if you publish someone's face without identifying them, you're in breach of, of you know, but without, that could be, that could constitute identifying them. And um, there was a case with uh, the Talk Talk, um, alleged Talk Talk hackers, where uh, the son, uh, or the Telegraph published a, a picture of one of these kids. It was quite reasonably um, obfuscated, his identity, but again, it, he was identified from it, um, and his family was harassed, etc. It's really classy from the Telegraph. Uh, yes, uh, it is protected, uh, facial images are protected under the Data Protection Act, but when you have a policing purpose, that will, that's a, a clear exemption for... Uh, sharing data. Additionally, there is, and I haven't found it, but I've been authoritatively informed that there is uh, exemption for um, policing per, uh, for sharing data within government under the Protection of Freedoms Act. So, if you have, uh, if you've uh, said yes, it's fine for the government to have some data. They don't need to. They, if you mandate a purpose, they don't need to care about that anymore. They can share it between departments, saying, "Yeah, you know, it's been we've been allowed to have it." Hi. That leads nicely on to my question. Um, I'm interested in biometric passport data, because if you can share face models from one to the other, then that would seem to me to be a good source for most of the people in this room, right? I can't hear you if you could shout at me. Oh, OK. Biometric passports, yeah? Yes. Very possibly. I mean, before, it wasn't really so much AFR before with, with passports until you get the, the e-gates coming in because authentication is done by a person. And I had this in, in Hamburg where a, a very sort of burly, um, surly German police officer was diligently uh, looking over my passport, comparing it to my face. Um, the the e-gates is absolutely, they, are, they do seem to be getting, getting faster. Um, I've only used one once actually, but... That's, uh, that is, and I think that is also the primary design and, and use and hope for biometric passports as well. Yeah. And, and something absolutely worth looking into in more detail. Hello. Okay, so um, you spoke about Facebook and um, them drawing the images off. Have you ever heard of, like, any third parties using Facebook to scan through, like, in the intelligence services or something? Um, not with Facebook, but there was a very famous, like, uh, case with, uh, in Russia where the Russian, Russian social network, I think it's vk.com or vk.ru or whatever. Um, well, basically the Russian version of 4chan, and if, if teenage boys can be trusted to do anything, it's uh, chase after pornographic models. And so an API was made with, uh, to this Russian Facebook's um, face print database, and they used it to identify uh, amateur porn models and then harass them online. Uh, so certainly it can happen. Um, Facebook has not at the moment allowed any access to uh, its, to sort of uh, question or query its uh, database of face prints. If it did, I mean, it would be, it is the largest face print database in the world that has ever existed. I mean, Facebook are right on the frontier of this technology and their research is as well. Um, they've got fantastic, really, they're doing, they're taking so much, so many strides forward when it comes to AI research and, and Facebook's artificial uh, research team, or FART, as I like to uh, call it, is, is exceptional. Um, but again, I think there is some uh, recognition that, uh, from Facebook particularly, that there is hesitation about the, you, their use of, of users' data. Um, their response and finding out more about their response to the uh, Irish Data Protection Commissioners, uh, informing them that the, the Face Prince database must be deleted on EU citizens would be very interesting. Uh, just thought I'd mention that um, there's a, a, a billboard in uh, um, Birmingham New Street that is doing uh, not, they specifically say that it's not doing facial recognition, but it is doing demographic recognition and 
targeting advertising to the people who are coming off the trains. I wasn't sure whether you were aware of it. No, that's but, really interesting. Yeah, and my concern is that, yeah, there's a fine line between a demographic recognition and facial recognition. Absolutely. And I don't know how they're processing it. I, I did find out that they were doing cloud um, uh, processing on it, so the data is at least going into AWS. <laughs> So, um, do you know who is running it? I believe it's actually Amazon. Oh, it, no, Amazon mm. are great. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, there was a, a, a sort of uh, website not too long ago, which was, uh, I don't know, uh, Age Robot or How Old Am I Robots, which you would upload a photograph to, and it would give you a rough estimation of your age. And, of course, it was quite crude. Um, it got people's ages wrong, and those, especially, I, I notice, uh, I remember, Louise Mensch uh, did it, and she was told she was a 25-year-old woman. She's quite happy to tweet about that. And the ability for this to get people's ages wrong was comical, and it made it a bit go a bit viral. Um, but this was, was actually run by Microsoft, and they were using it to show how good Azure um, was at uh, handling surprise workloads and needing rapidly to, uh, to scale up in terms of... Um, server uh, demands. Um, and I think when we look at uh, facial recognition, the future of facial recognition, um, it is going to be connected very deeply with, uh, with cloud technologies. That is where the, the processing and the, the storage is going to be. Thank you very much, Alexander. Lovely. Thank you, guys. Cheers.